record. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Okay, thanks, Stacy. All right. Fantastic. Well, welcome back if you were here before and a brand new welcome if you weren't. So, and if possible, leave your uh, cameras on so I can see who I'm talking to as if we're in the same room and I can see how, you know, how you're reacting, etc. Um, we'll have lots of times time for Q&A at the end. So please just use the chat box crazy as we're going along. Things occur to you, just put it in the chat box and we'll come back to it. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and start the PowerPoint. All right. And I always have record <laughs> as a slide because, yeah, so easy to forget it. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, as many of you probably know, uh, I've been traveling and giving workshops on how to teach our kids specifically to read for about 30 years. And it all started because of my now 38 year old son. When he was four and a half, I started teaching him to read because I had a mentor. Um, and then the rest is history. He was an independent reader by the time he was eight. So over the last 30 years, I've developed a reading program that works. And that's the, you know, the operative word is does it work works it works so that's where all of this came from and the strategies that i have pulled in from i went into this uh much more in the first class but i have pulled in strategies that are the most effective since about the 1950s they are not known in the school classroom typically at all unless there are teachers who have been trained by me or who have the materials um, so it's Glenn Dolman's Institute for the Achievement of Human Potential, the NACD, the National Association for Child Development, other right hemisphere learning schools, which are in Japan and now worldwide. So what I am going to run through quickly are the strategies that work. And I'll explain a little bit about why they work, even though I talked more about that last time. All right, I'm going to get back into the PowerPoint. All right. So specialreads.com is my website where you'll find three different levels of reading programs, starting with emergent, meaning ground zero, or knowing less than 75 words cold, can recognize them anywhere. Now, uh, emergent, primer, first grade. All right. But they're not grade relative and they're not age relative. All right. I'm going to go ahead and admit. There we go. All right. Okay. The seminal work for this, which uh, Woodbine House published my book, Whole Child Reading, in 2016. Uh, then Woodbine House was a COVID casualty after, what, 47 years of being our primary go to publisher for special needs. It was a tragedy, but I had to then take the book and republish it. So this is what it looks like now on Amazon. And I took advantage of the fact that I had to reprint it. And I updated the whole book, everything and added two new chapters. And this is the brand new Spanish translation, which is only available as an ebook, but it's on Amazon. All right. All right. So we're going to review. All right, there are four strategies. Mercifully, there are only four. Three are teaching strategies. One is a testing strategy. All right, so we're going to go through that fast flash sandwich style teaching. Both of those have extremely much to do with the brain. And then the magic decoding card, which I'll explain and errorless testing techniques. The errorless testing techniques were designed decades ago by Pat Olwine at the University of Washington. She had three, three techniques, matching, selecting, naming from easy to harder. But I've added a fourth because that that is actually not sufficient. And we'll talk about that in a minute, because today we're going to talk about testing in detail. Last week, we just a couple of weeks ago, we just glanced over it. All right. Fast flash. What is it? It's a right hemisphere learning technique of teaching. It is extremely high speed because that's the way the brain takes in information and retains it. And that's all we care about. Right. 
We want them to keep what we're showing. All right, it synchronizes with that speed and the ability of the brain to be. It, have you ever, I, I once hit Bambi on the highway accidentally and found out that the airbag deploys at 200 miles an hour. Well, if you've ever experienced that, you know how fast that is. And the, the transmission of information across a neuron has been clocked at 200 miles an hour. So why we're holding a flashcard up there for five minutes and going over it and no. All right. This works well with student who are, students who are strong visual learners, our kids, Down syndrome, and typically autism as well. Very strong visual learners, very poor auditory learners. All right. And we went into that last time. All right. How, how fast? Slow is one card per second. Optimum is two cards per second. So it's bam, 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 showing them. And we'll go over that. All right, so here's an example. <clears throat> this is uh, one of my little students at the DSALA, um, who is, if I could have cloned this guy, I would have. I mean, he looks, he's not looking everywhere else, he's paying attention. He does have a reward. If you look to the left of the table, there's a little brown ball in a red basket. That's his reward. He gets the ball when he has paid attention and done really well. All right, so five cards in a group, I'm, I've only got five in my hand, and you show them three times. Why five? Because typically our kids with delays have five working memory channels, meaning they can comfortably hold five bits of information at a time. Okay, on top of that, we're gonna show them rapidly for the brain, and we're gonna show them three times. Why do we show them three times? Twice is not enough, four times is boring, and we will lose them. So here we go, let's watch it. Are you ready? Okay. One, pizza. No, yum. Yes. One, pizza. No, yum. Yes. One, pizza. No, yum. Yes. Awesome. You watch so well. Thank you. High five. All right. Okay. Why are the cards red? The cards are red because the brain prefers it and is going to pay attention to it. We don't put red type in a book because that's harder to read. But as far as grabbing the attention with one word, it works beautifully. All right. The other thing that I want you to notice, because we went into this more in more detail last time, is that I'm holding the cards a little bit above his eyes horizon level. And the reason for that is neurolinguistic programming has discovered that that position of the eyes is the ideal position for which the brain retains an image. Okay, a word is an image. So that's why. There's, there's a, there is a reason for everything that I've designed. All right, and I don't always explain it, but just trust, yeah, there's a reason for that, all right? Okay, and the speed, if you wanna really get into this, go to rightbraineducationlibrary.com and you can find out a lot of information about these three main uh, instigators of right hemisphere learning techniques, all right? Okay, Diane, if you would mute yourself, that would be good. Thanks. <laughs> Can, do you know how to do that? Are you talking about me? Yeah, great, thank you. We were picking up a little noise. Okay, okay that's perfect, thank you. All right, let's keep going. All right, so originally, there were two schools of this thought, Bob Dolman and Glenn Dolman in the US, but now it's worldwide. Japan, the same thing, the Shichita method and the Higuru method worldwide. All right. Here's the trick. Here's the ticket. <laughs> Speed, fast, plus size, big, plus frequency, twice a day. I, my, I preach five minutes twice a day if that's all the time you've got. The frequency is important. 10 minutes once a day is not going to cut it like two twice for five minutes. It's the brain getting it, getting it, getting it. Then the brain does other things and, you know, eating and whatever and playing and doing homework. And then the brain comes back and gets it again. That's massively important. So those three things together equal brain success. All right. Second strategy, sandwich style teaching. This is all about repetition and it's about reading for meaning and i'll explain it 
So the bread before and after the peanut butter and jelly are the same five cards before, same cards afterwards. Now, as you got a more advanced reader, you can have two groups of five before the same two groups afterward, but you're not going to put 10 cards together and show 10 because that doesn't work for, for working memory. All right. All right. And the peanut butter and jelly is the awesome material, reading material that you're going to read that those words are in. We never teach random words. Everything that we do is to go in through the heart and teach to the brain like we talked about last time. That is the whole basis of my book, Whole Child Reading. We go in through the heart and teach to the brain. What does that mean? We only use materials that are in that that are of high, high, high interest to them. And we teach with right hemisphere brain techniques. All right. So first we grab them because they're really interested in whatever it is. That's why those of you who have gotten my program know that in that first that all seven picture books, which are separate from the high frequency books, all five, all seven picture books are about food because I figured, okay, I can, I can grab most kids with that. With my own son, I had to make all of the books myself and it helped that I was a graphic designer and illustrator. Okay. So I could do that, but nobody else has time to do that. So I made personal book after personal book. Each one was more advanced and the type got smaller and smaller and smaller, et cetera. Until, like I said, at eight and a half, he was, he was done. He was on his own. All right. So let's keep going. Let me get back to here. All right. So for example, if you're teaching the spaghetti book, you have five spaghetti words before, five after, and there's the book. All right. Third strategy, magic decoding card. Why is it magic? I didn't give it that name, but one of my parents did. Uh, a mom had brought in her son. He was about 11. And she said, he's reading at a first grade level, but I want to, I want to bring him further. So I said, okay, fine. So her son was sitting here. We're at this narrow little table that I use for teaching. And she was behind him, couldn't see a thing that we were doing. So I took one of my, the first grade books from my reading program and he's doing great. He's reading along and then he stops and I got out this card and the way we use it, it's just a blank business size card. I covered everything except the first letter. And normally I would say, what's that sound? But this, this, this boy was advanced enough. I didn't have to say anything. So I just covered the first letter so he could focus and see what that was, what that sound was. And then I showed him the second letter and then I pulled the card away and then he got it. So after the session, his mother said to me, what was that card? Was that a magic card? He doesn't know the word. You put this card down. You don't say anything. And he says the word. So that's the technique. So the name stuck. All right. So. When people order from me, I put in one of these cards. So little instructions on one side, blank on the other. You use the blank side. So for instance, there's the word puppy under here and pizza. Uh, obviously, this can be confusing, right? They both have five, five letters and they both start with P. So you can't guess very well. So you cover everything except what is that sound? What's that sound? Puh, puh, okay. Puh. Oh, well, right away I can see, mm, that's not gonna be pizza. Okay, and then you quickly pull it away. This is not a labored over technique. If you're using it with your child, and I highly recommend it that you use it because it helps them in so many ways. Number one, our kids really don't know they can decode. I've seen this happen over and over again. And when you do this and you say, what's that sound? They go, it's like a light bulb goes off instead of, oh, I'm just going to guess because mom wants me to say something or dad wants or the teacher wants me to say something. I don't want to look dumb. I want to say something. So I'm going to guess. I just call it wild guessing. And every student that came in had this habit. So it's a matter of retraining. But to cover it up and say, what's that sound? So I've seen the light bulb go off. It's like, oh, I can figure this out. Yeah, they can. All right. All right, errorless testing. So we're done with the three teaching strategies. Errorless testing. This avoids FOF syndrome, which is, I've made up all kinds of syndromes. They're all real, but FOF means fear of failure syndrome, which our kids, most of our kids have. So if they see a task that they 
they, uh, they think, no way, no, I can't do this. This is too hard. No, I'm out of here with this. If they're verbal, they're going to tell you that. And if they're nonverbal, they're just going to act out. So FOF syndrome, fear of failure syndrome, we want to head that off at the pass. We do not want to trigger that. Errorless testing is a beautiful way, along with the, the magic decoding card, of doing this. So of avoiding it. Let me show you. All right. Step one, two, three, matching, selecting, naming. As I said, Patricia Olwine came up with this at the University of Washington after working with kids with Down syndrome for like three decades. So easy, match a word to the same word. Selecting, two words, oh, which one is puppy? Oh, I've got to pick this one. Naming, what's this card? What's this word? And you're holding up a card. Okay, so that is where Patricia Olwine stopped as far as I know from her book, <laughs> I haven't worked with her personally, but what I found in teaching is that that's not enough because our kids can get to the point where they can name that card, but they can't generalize it. They can't read it in any sentence, anywhere on a billboard, in a book, doesn't matter. They can't. So we need to help them generalize that word. So that's where I suggest a step four generalizing. Okay, what tool can you use for that? Well, there's a super simple, super fast, free tool that you can use for that. So, oh, okay, hold on. I'm going to get to that. I'm jumping ahead. I'll talk about the fourth step in a minute. First of all, let's go back to matching, selecting, naming. Give prompts, verbal prompts, like the sound, the initial sound, like the initial sound of a word that you're trying to get them to choose. Physical prompts, you can actually tap the right word. What we're doing is giving them prompts so they're not going to fail. And as we're training them and as they're learning these words, we withdraw the prompts. You know, we gradually just withdraw the prompts as they don't need them anymore. All right. And encouragement. Great job. All right. So, for instance, matching. Now, keep in mind. They are not matching cold words in the beginning of their reading journey. There's no way. You are fast flashing these words, and these words are in some really cool reading material that either you've created or you've gotten from me or you've modified from a trade book, and we'll get into that later. All right? All right. So, match. Where's puppy? Can you put this on puppy? And keep in mind, you're not asking them, what's this word? No, 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 no. You're handing them puppy and you're saying, this is puppy. Can you match puppy? Can you find puppy? All right. Uh, one of the things that I really struggle with teaching teachers and parents in the certification course that I offer, I offer a cert an eight week certification course in this, which I have a slide at the very end of the PowerPoint that I'll show you that. Um, and you can either be a parent or a parent and teacher or just a teacher. But one of the things I struggle with is that getting getting my, my grown-up students to understand you're not testing them right out of the chute. No, you're teaching. Teaching is fun. Teaching is, is engaging. Everybody's having a good time. Testing is over here. Teaching is not testing, all right? But again, when we do test, we're never saying, what's that word? Or I mean, I've seen this so many times that, and I'm saying, please don't test yet. She can't even read yet. Please don't test. Sorry, I'm, I'm on my soapbox here. Anyway, okay, here we go. So matching, begin with a field of two as the learner progresses, increase to a field of three, so she's choosing from three or four, and eventually six. For instance, in a lotto game, which has six, right? Um, don't go beyond, don't go, don't put 10 cards in front of the, the child. It's visually very confusing. Just stop at six. All right, selecting, show me daddy. All right, keeping in mind, you've been fa fast flashing these words. All right, what's this? Okay, now this is okay if you get to the naming part, but we're not, we're not asking what's this word until we get to this. Okay, until we get to that step. All right, so now let's talk about generalizing. Personal pages. It's fast, easy, free, and it's very, very effective. What you want to do with personal pages, which you can do by hand, you don't even need a computer if you can print nicely, is you want to test 
the vocabulary that you think they've mastered in the books that you're already using. Maybe you're using my high frequency series books. Maybe you're using my picture books. Maybe you're using personal books that you made yourself. Okay, do they have they really mastered those words? Well, I'm going to create a personal page about them. It has to be almost like a diary. Maybe they had pizza for supper or whatever. And you use the vocabulary that you want to test. Have they mastered this? For example, um, the word, the, the color words are, are, are early in the high frequency book. So let's say red, blue, yellow. So um, you might say, uh, say her name is Lily. Lily has a red balloon. That's for Lily. You have to take it out of the original context and put that word in a meaningful context for her. All right, so super simple. Uh, my method is to have colored markers uh, so that the child gets buy-in from the beginning. What color do you want? Okay, and then I use that color. I make a photocopy, send the color copy home, and keep the photocopy. So you can send it home for the parents. And, and the homework I would give would be, the personal page goes home, the child has to read it to somebody in the family, even the dog, once a day until I see the child again. All right. It's a terrific uh, generalizing tool. I'll say this is an example. This is what it looks like if you do it yourself. All right. If you do it just by hand. Now, you're doing it at the level of the child. This is so important. This is another thing that's easily misunderstood. You're doing so. Let's say I have an emergent reader. You're only going to have three word sentences and maybe three sent little short sentences on a page. That's it. This is a child who's reading at a higher level. All right. All right. Much higher level. All right. These are things that I actually created in in a session. Now you collect those pages, get a three ring, uh, a, a three ring binder and either a hole punch, three, three hole puncher or just buy just by stock that is already pre 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 hold <laughs> by three hole punch stock and the deal here is you've created two things a diary and a vocabulary review tool so let's say you've got 10 pages in there by you know week after week after week you flip back okay let's read this one let's read this one eight pages back she's going to want to read it because it's about her and then you very quickly find out oh has she retained this or do we need to kind of drill that more with some new personal pages all right all right it's very motivating and we repeat vocabulary all right i want to talk about some a term you probably have not heard oculomotor fatigue which applies to our kids i was giving an all-day workshop in canada pre-covid and at at intermission, one of the attendees came up to me and she said, I'm a vision specialist and you're always preaching about huge letters for flashcards and large font for books. And she said, there's another reason for that, besides the fact that it's easier for the brain and the brain can grab it and can retain it better. She said, there's another reason. She said, the hypotonia that our kids with Down syndrome have also is present in the eye muscles. And so if they're reading small type for a while, she said, the fatigue is going to kick in with the eye muscles and it's gonna be like, oh, you know. So that is another reason for the large type. It's also another reason for taking a break. Let's say the child has been working really well for 20 minutes. If you go past that without taking some kind of action break, you know, throwing a ball, tossing a ball or doing something else to give the, the eye muscles a break, then you get and the brain and get give the because brain fatigue kicks in. So then you come back to it and it's refreshed. All right. And the eyes have had a chance to relax. So oculomotor fatigue, just remember that. All right. <clears throat> this next one is extremely important. We're going to talk today about dual diagnoses, <clears throat> specifically. Down syndrome with ASD, Down syndrome with autism, or anywhere on the spectrum, and Down syndrome and CAS, childhood apraxia of speech. We're going to talk about those two, 
because they're the most frequently found with our kids as far as co-occurring diagnoses, all right? Now, this is a brand new term that medical, some medical circles are now using. It's a fabulous term for you to learn and memorize. Diagnostic overshadowing, what is it? Oh, it's just Down syndrome. We expect that. You know, you take your child in, he's seven, he's not talking yet. Oh, it's just Down syndrome. Not, it is not, it is not. The child is seven, he's not talking, that is not Down syndrome. There's a huge difference between a developmental delay, which we expect with Down syndrome. And of course, there's a wide, a wide margin there, right, of delay. But that is not the same thing as a medical diagnosis of either apraxia or autism. That is a different ball game. It's not just Down syndrome. So let's look at this then. Let's look first at DSASD. All right. What is the data on co-occurrence? Approximately 20% of our kids with Down syndrome are on the spectrum, but diagnostic overshadowing, psh, that comes along and they escape the, not only the analysis and the diagnosis, but the services that go along with it and the help that that particular learner needs. So as far as statistics go, actually, so I checked this out recently with Sandra, depending on what criteria is used, Co-occurrence is estimated at between 18% of our kids with Down syndrome all the way up to 39%. So I need you to remember this. I need you to know this, all right? So if there's a dual diagnosis, how does that impact our teaching? We teach to the autism. And I have this from the highest authority, which is the following. The C Center for Down Syndrome at Children's Colorado, Children's Hospital Colorado, Aurora, Colorado. Here is their website at, so it's childrenscolorado.org, but then you wanna search for Anna and John C Center for Down Syndrome, or just C Center for Down Syndrome. The physician who founded this C Center is the dad of a 20 something year old boy with down syndrome and autism and so this doctor having lived with it recognized it is profoundly underdiagnosed so he has started this center which specializes in guiding advising parent families who have a child with our teen or an adult with this dual diagnosis and people come from all over to the C center for help. So why, okay, why spend time on this today? Because actually what helps our learners with this dual diagnosis also helps our learners with Down syndrome because there can be other things. There can be ADHD. Uh, when my son was seven, when he was three, I realized he also had ADHD because oh, it, well, he just did. And my sister's son, had, who is neurotypical, had a severe ADHD. So I had already been, already been watching her. So with Jonathan, I tried the fine gold diet for hyperactive children. That helped a little bit, a lot of trouble, but it helped a little bit. By the time he was seven, we were at our wit's end. So we took him to, we lived in Cincinnati, and Jonathan still does. Um, which is a whole nother story and I digress, but we took him to uh, the Down Syndrome Center at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. And the head doctor there was a fabulous doctor, Dr. Bonnie Patterson, knew what she was doing. She knew what, this is DSASD, this is DSADHD, this is DSADD, this is AD, DS with ODD, Oppositional Defiant Disorder. She knew, she knew everything. So <clears throat> they diagnosed him, they evaluated him for about four weeks. He had to see the SLP, the OT, the PT, the pediatrician, the psychiatrist. <clears throat> and at the end of that time, they diagnosed him with very, this, these were Dr. Patterson's words, very severe ADHD and also ODD, oppositional def defiant disorder. All right, so what 
I'm saying is what I'm going to t teach you today can help with all of this. <laughs> all right. Why are our children and teens underdiagnosed? Well, I just gave you the term diagnostic overshadowing. All right, but let's break it down further. Doctors, doctors don't know. They think that, you know, the speech delay, yeah, he can't talk, he's seven or eight. He's got two or three words, but they're not very clear. It's just Down syndrome because they don't have the experience there. They're not trained. How can we expect them to be trained in that actually? Even developmental pediatricians, because I've sent some of my parents there, even developmental pediatricians are not always going to get it. All right, they're not experienced enough. For example, <clears throat> one student at the DSALA, brand new student, he came in, I think the boy was about nine. I took one look at him and I said, oh, okay, he's on the spectrum too. So I didn't say that to the dad. I said, I think there's something else going on here. I would like you to take him in for an evaluation. <clears throat> he needs a really good evaluation to rule out any other diagnosis. So uh, take him to, a, not don't rely on the school for this. Take him, you know, pay for a private evaluation, perhaps with a developmental pediatrician. So a couple of weeks later, the dad came in and I said, did you have an evaluation done? Oh, yes, yes. And, he said, no, it's just, the doctor said it's just Down syndrome. I said, well, tell me about the evaluation. He said, well, I sent my son in with the doctor. He was in there for 30 minutes. He wouldn't cooperate at all. The doctor came out and said, no, it's just Down syndrome. Okay, so I have told you what a qualified evaluation is already with Jonathan. It took four weeks. I saw all these people. That's not a qualified evaluation. So... <laughs> The, whoever the doctor was could not work with the child, could not evaluate, <clears throat> and it was just a, anyway. So I just dropped it. <clears throat> Second reason, a parent <clears throat> does not want, wait, hold on, water break. <clears throat> the child already has a label. <clears throat> the parent realistically does not want a second label on it. However, second label gets you services. All right. And <clears throat> what I try to tell parents is you're living with it. Your child is living with it. <clears throat> and you need the services. Sorry about this. <clears throat> Third reason, the school may not have the staff. If you get that diagnosis, then the school's going to have to ante up and give you services that it wasn't giving you previously. Lorraine, is there anything you want me to repeat? Did you just bring in your husband? <laughs> okay, hi. All right, but we can go over it more later. Anyway, so the school may resist it. They're not going to want, don't have your child evaluated by the school, whatever. Don't do that. Do a private evaluation. But now that I've told you what, what an, a valid evaluation consists of, do not settle for 30 minutes in a doctor's office. All right. Okay, and why is that assessment so important? Services, services, services. And you can talk to Sandra about this because her son was diagnosed. I think he was really young. I think he might have even been four-ish or something. You can check with Sandra on that. But he was diagnosed with Down syndrome and autism. And it took her three tries before she got a really good ABA specialist and turned the family's life around. All right. <clears throat> so services, services, services. So I told you what I meant by an accurate assessment. Okay. So let's go back to, I've just taken Jonathan in. He's seven years. It was the week of his seventh birthday. He got evaluated. We got the diagnosis. And by the way, um, his ADHD was so bad that the, Dr. Patterson said, typically we say, uh, let's just try therapy, you know, let's work with this, let's not do the drugs yet. But she said, in his case, let's go straight to the drugs. So we tried Ritalin for three days. It made him triple ADHD. And we had to stop that. We tried another drug that didn't work either. So I spent the next five years uh, researching and applying natural healing methods and it worked but it took a lot of time it took us about an hour and a half a day to do a certain certain kinds of therapies um and if you want to know 
more about it, you can email me. I was not able to put that in my Down Syndrome Parenting book. For those of you who don't know, I wrote a book with Woodbine House called Down Syndrome Parenting 101. It's on Amazon. I also had to republish that when I'm, when Woodbine closed. Uh, and I cover this partly, but as Woodbine House told me, no, we can't put all the details about what you actually did because this is not a medical book, da, 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 da. But if you want to know, you can email me. Okay, so Donathan gets evaluated and it's Christmas time. Dad is out of town, of course. Dad is out of town. And I took both of my kids. So I have my seven-year-old Jonathan and my five-and-a-half-year-old daughter, who is neurotypical. And she's now an ESL teacher. Go figure, of course. Of course she's an ESL teacher. Anyway, so I take them to the Cincinnati Festival of a Million Lights. And we pull in to the park. I tried to pull into the parking lot. And the choo-choo train is going. And the Christmas carols are blaring. And the million lights are doing this. And my son puts his hands over his ears and screams bloody murder. I couldn't even park. And I realized this is not going to work. So I had to pull out of the parking lot, at which point my daughter started screaming bloody murder because she wanted to go to the festival. All right. Well, eventually when dad came back in town, I took my daughter to go see it. So she got taken care of. But anyway, so everybody's traumatized. The next morning, bright and early, I called the, the Down syndrome clinic at the hospital. And I, I talked to one of the pediatricians who had evaluated him. I said, what was that? He said, don't even take him to the mall. Don't even take him to a large grocery store. And he explained it beautifully. So you and I, all of us, we have these five senses. Everybody's got these five senses. What happens to us? If we're sitting reading a book we're crazy about, we're really engrossed in this book, we're in an easy chair reading the book, what happens to our senses? Smell's gone, touch is gone, taste's gone, hearing is turned way down, it may even be turned off. Maybe somebody's calling us from the next room, we can't hear it. We have the ability to regulate. All right, so the doctor explained, kids with ADHD or ASD do not have that ability. He said every single knob, if you can visualize it that way, is turned up to 10,000. So sight's up, hearing's up, smell's up, touch, taste. And what happens? Sensory overload, complete overload. That's it. We are out of here. Now, I want to recommend this if you even suspect your child is on the spectrum or if you have trouble getting through to your child. These people are fabulous. It's run by two 30 something or 40 something as people, guys with Asperger's who have been through it and now help families, parents, and teachers. And get through to kids who are on the spectrum. And he talks, he gives free workshops. I can't recommend these guys enough. They're fabulous. So free workshop, take a free workshop from him. He recently gave, um, the head the head director, recently gave a workshop on defense mode. So he's explaining how to move your child out of defense mode. Now, what I just showed you with the big red star, that's defense mode. And he said, when a child or teen or whatever is in defense mode, he said 100% of their being is concerned with protection. They cannot hear what you're saying. They cannot follow instructions. You're never going to get through to them. So he trains parents and families and teachers how to move that individual out of defense mode. It's brilliant. They are brilliant. So even if you even are having any kind of trouble like that, go there. Okay, defense mode free workshop and of course and they've written a book uh and they if you sign up for a very moderately priced workshop after the free workshop the book comes with it i mean they're just giving this stuff away it's it's fantastic all right now these are some practical teaching tips that you can use whether it's adhd or whether it's down syndrome opposition <laughs> stubbornness it doesn't matter 
These are tips that work. All right, on the left, I have two laminated blank pages that, well, I have lots of different sizes, and I isolate a line that the child is having trouble focusing on. <clears throat> and one of my students at the DSALA, who was about 11, a girl with a double, dual diagnosis, she had been di diagnosed, um, she was having such trouble just focusing on that one line. I knew she could read it if she could focus on it because she was at that level. And so I got out two pieces of, of paper and I covered it over just like you're seeing. And she had a fit and knocked him away and said, no, no, no. And then I talked her into it. I said, I'm only going to do it once. If you don't like it, I'm never going to do it again. So she said, okay. So I used the, the paper and it helped her so much that every session after that, she wouldn't read without the paper. She needs the, needed those two papers there. So she was a convert. <laughs> All right, so upper right, using a flashlight pen. Now, one important thing, about, especially with autism, ditch the lights, turn the lights down, turn them off, use soft incandescent lighting, because the light, the, the visual is very, very, very distracting. And a child with autism walking into any room is going to see it all, okay? visual overload that's not how we work we're going to focus on one thing or this or that the other but it's visual overload defense mode all right so this helps a lot and it gives them control and i would have a flashlight as well a flashlight pen and they have one and it keeps them on target right another thing at the bottom right certain classical music mostly mozart and early baroque um and there are books written on this subject but the the main criteria and this is tech technical stuff but the the music from this era mozart or early baroque has to have between 55 and 70 beats per minute and it has to be turned the volume so low you can barely hear it the brain will pick up on it and that's what we want the brain will pick up on it but the child won't really notice it and you're not supposed to notice it it needs to be that soft what happens What's the value of this? Well, the beauty of the music engages the right hemisphere, the melody, <clears throat> the beauty, the feeling of it. <clears throat> music, and I have a master's in music, <clears throat> so I can vouch for this, music is math. It's just numbers. All right, so the left hemisphere is attracted by the math, the logic. Okay, so we've got what we want is full engagement. We want whole brain engagement and that's what this music does in the background all right <clears throat> you can also you've probably heard of this composer stephen halpern h-a-l-p-e-r-n uh, who has written he does new age <clears throat> you know synthesis etc but he's got a whole bunch of albums that are alpha brainwave Alpha brainwave is what we want for learning because it helps to put the information into long term storage, which can be done in the alpha state. All right, which is another thing, another reason why it's good to stop teaching after 15, 20 minutes. What the, the, the brainwave you and I are in right now is beta. I'm yakking at you. You're listening. We're here. We're looking. That's beta. But that doesn't go into long term storage. In order for the alpha state to get engaged, we need to stop and do something else, maybe something we enjoy, take a walk, cook, whatever. So that puts us in, then that goes into storage. So long-term storage. So let's say, let me, hypothetically, you've been teaching for 15, reading for 15 minutes, very, very low volume. Okay, it's break time. Turn the volume way up to an enjoyable level because that music is going to help put the child in that state. And then when you're ready to work again, you turn it way down. So those are just some tips. All right. Incandescent, soft incandescent lighting. By all means, avoid fluorescent lighting like schools have, of course. There have been studies done about this. Not good for kids anyway. All right. This last tip, <clears throat> this is in the old DSALA office. This was a corner of my office. And this is Daisy. 
Daisy was not diagnosed with autism until she was in her 20s, um, <clears throat> which of course is very late, but we worked with it. Now, when Daisy first came in, she had she was not getting services yet and her she could not focus at all not on a flashcard not on not on this is her personal page not on a nothing and then one day so of course it was very frustrating for her for me she was just you know she could not look all right so i thought wait a minute i've got an empty corner of the office so i took her personal page i taped it to the wall there is nothing visual anywhere except that personal page it's not the same as sitting at a desk when she's you know it's all this stuff behind no 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 all right so blank wall put the paper up there I showed her what I wanted her to do and she got it next time she came in the office she walked right over to there and did this and it blew me away blew me away she couldn't point to the word before so reduce the visual field we have to help them out all right, now um, I'm going to give you a minute. Do you need to write some questions in the chat box? All right, use the chat box, write those questions. Let me see what time it is. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to move along. Okay, but I want to answer your questions, so please. And at the end, we'll be un we can unmute ourselves and everybody can also verbally ask questions if you want. But I want to make sure I get to your questions. All right. So put them in the chat box. All right. We'll move on to the second diagnosis that is overshadowed. All right. We teach reading for meaning, but because I preached that in the first class, reading for meaning, reading for meaning. We're not teaching reading for decoding or teaching reading for meaning. All right. Is there a secondary goal? You bet. You bet. We teach reading to teach talking. All right. Now, this is a quote from Sue Buckley in Downside International. You probably know about that organization. They are the gold standard. Children with Down syndrome of all ages are usually able to learn more effectively from what they can see than from what they can hear. Therefore, children will understand and remember how to say words and sentences earlier if they learn to read from a young age. All right. So, <clears throat> Emily's grandma gave me permission to share these. <laughs> So this was little Emily when she first came in on the left. Her grandma brought her in every week for reading, except for holidays. <laughs> she was devoted. Now, I want you to notice something. <clears throat> so what I'm going to show you is not apraxia, but you might think it is. So I want to train you. Watch her mouth. Watch her tongue. She's not really moving the mouth. She's not really moving the tongue much at all. And she is doing echolalia. I say, Emily, what did you do in school today? She says, Emily, school. All right. So on the right is about two years later. Speech therapy has not changed. The only thing that changed is reading lessons every single week. All right. This is, like I said, it's not apraxia. Uh, it is what I call TMT syndrome. She has TMT syndrome, which I borrowed from my son. He used to tell me, too much trouble, too much trouble. TMT syndrome. Okay. It's too much trouble. I mean, there's hypotonia in the tongue. It is too much. It's a lot of work to articulate. Anyway, so here we go. Watch her mouth and tongue. So, Emily, what did you do in school today? What did you do in school today? What? Huh? Good. Oh, you did good. Yeah. Well, what did you... Okay. Whoops. Hyperactive mouse. Let me go back. All right. <clears throat> Keep in mind, speech therapy has not changed. Sorry? Okay. <clears throat> Look. Is. Sweet. Is right here. Is. Me. What is this? She. Good job. Me. Uh -huh. Play. Very good. I play and jump. Good job. Me. Mm, what is that? Mm. Mom. 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 Good job. Oh. <laughs> 
Look down at ball. the ball. Ball. Uh -huh. Ball. Mm -hmm. Start over again. My. My. Ball. Is. Um. Down. 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 Very good. Okay. Now. This just proves the point. If they can see the word and they get used to reading the word, it can make all the difference that parents would say, oh my gosh, she's been putting together, you know, seven words, five words, seven words. And before it was just like two words together, three words, maybe, because these students have been reading that many words. Uh, the book she's reading is the lookbook. It's the second in my high frequency uh, book series. <clears throat> in my program. All right, let's keep going. So Emily, what did you do? All right, <clears throat> let me see if we have time. Um, all right, this, oh, Anna, Anna Maria. <laughs> this is your son, are you still there? <laughs> yes, I'm here, I'm sorry. I ha I'm, I've been talking on the phone with my daughter in Edinburgh. That's okay. why. Oh, whoa, just, yes. okay. So, so yes, it's Elliot, oh my God. Yes. Put my, myself on mute. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. This was Elliot. Now, Anna Maria can can correct me if I'm wrong, but at the time, uh, Elliot could only be understood by his family and maybe his teacher sometime. All right. And everybody er at school erroneously assumed he could not make certain sounds. All right. Now the truth is he's somewhere on the apraxia spectrum and. I don't know, you know, what and he has ADHD too. And ADHD too. Oh, lovely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So I made this little film of him. I sent it to Anna Maria. She watched it and she said, you got to come into the school. I want you to show this to the speech therapist. Blah, 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 blah. So I did. And actually when I took it to the school and met with the principal, it was Anna Maria, and I think, I don't remember if your husband was there, but you were there, and the principal was there, and the special ed teacher was there, but the SLP, speech therapist, was too busy to come. So I showed this little film on my iPad, you know, and the, this principal said, just a minute. <laughs> she went and got the speech therapist and brought it back. She said, show that again. Okay, so what, what I'm showing you in here is that with encouragement, Elliot could actually, keep going, he could actually get some of these sounds that everyone thought was impossible. Ah, no, 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 back. Okay, now I didn't understand that. I want it nice and clear, so start over. Good, that's good. First, first. Uh, okay. Race. Race. Thank you. Uh, uh, what is that? Uh, is. Uh, uh huh. And uh, good. Pan. Japan. 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 I heard mm. that is. That's very oh, good. Oh. I know, Francesco. He's a bad dude. All right. So the point is that he could make those sounds, but he. But it was TMT, too much trouble. So, okay, so let's go. Okay, here we are. All right, it's a common co-occurrence, all right? Very important to know, it is not a developmental delay. It is not. It is a motor disorder. The brain has problems organizing and planning to move the muscles and body parts required for speech. Very important for you to know, the brain knows what it wants to say. The child knows what it wants to say. It does not come out because the muscles cannot cooperate. There is a miscommunication and an inability of the muscles and body parts required to say those things, all right? Very important to know. So if you wanna get your child evaluated to see if they're on the, the CAS spectrum and you take the child into a speech therapist, who is not a specialist in CAS. You have to take the child to someone who specializes in CAS, all right? It's essential. Otherwise, what you're likely to get is they're gonna check the box, developmental delay, speech delay, developmental delay. You're not gonna get any help. You're not gonna get specialized speech therapy with that. And our kids need specialized speech therapy. It's different if they have a proxy. 
All right. Medical, it's a medical diagnosis. It's not a developmental delay. The NACD that I mentioned before, they, they're very big on working with apraxia. They even go to their, uh, their website and check that out. Now, this <clears throat> is a child who had severe apraxia. And when he started taking his reading lesson, he had some good signs. He was, you know, his mom was great with that. Um, but he really didn't, ha I think he had maybe two words. All right, and those were not very good. All right, he has severe apraxia. I want you to watch his mouth, his tongue, and watch how hard he is working to try to produce approximations. Now with a child with apraxia, if I'm trying to test their reading, if they give a consistent approximation for a word over and over again, that's it, they're reading that word. I totally take that as reading. And you'll hear from him, like for instance, when he says, he sees the word C, it's G, all right? That's his C. That is the best his muscles and the body parts involved can do. All right, so the, the parents, his parents could get no help from the school. This is one of my worst stories. Makes me try not to get angry about this. This the schools, the, the parents said he needs speech therapy. They said, no, we're not going to give him speech therapy because he has no language. So the parents said, well, then we want you to teach him signing. No, we're not going to teach him signing because we want him to talk. If that is not the most crazy making thing you've ever heard of. So mom's sister was an SLP. Yay. <laughs> So between the mom and the sister, mom told me she downloaded a stack of papers this thick of apraxia worksheets, <laughs> and they worked like crazy with him. So here is where the last time that I saw him, this is how he's doing. Oh, G. Good job. Ready? T. Good job. Good job. Good job. All right. Good. All right. Okay. I hope that is clear. The, oh. amount, the amount of effort that it's taking. Um, I also want to mention another resource, Gemini.com. It is a special website. You have to buy the program. I think it's, I don't know, $300 or something. Uh, it's, it's Gemini with a double I. And I can't remember where that double I is, but you can just try to search for Gemini speech therapy. Uh, and they specifically, all, their entire program is targeted toward helping kids with apraxia. All right. And I've heard from other parents that it's very helpful. All right, I'm not gonna show the first one, I'm gonna show the second one for lack of time. Whoops. But this is a way to test reading ability for a child who is nonverbal, all right? So let's see, where am I? All right, I... another way we can build sentences. Elizabeth is gonna build a sentence. Elizabeth swims with Nemo and his friends. So let's put the cards out, here we go. Elizabeth has All severe right. apraxia. She All of them. To just Ready? kind of moan. Okay. But smart as All a whip. Right. Here uh, we go. Okay, that was her okay. sound. Elizabeth. Good job. Swims. Mm -hmm. Good job. With. With. Where's with? Good. With. Good. Nemo, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. his, his friends. Good job, Elizabeth. Good job. So let's read. <laughs> Elizabeth, Swift, Nemo, mm -hmm. and his friends. Very good, Elizabeth. Awesome. Okay, now, um, 
Let's see. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, they were all muted. Um, this child was so smart. And by this age, she probably knew a thousand signs. Her mom had given her an iPad at a very young age with apps on it for signs. And at first the mother helped her, but after that, Elizabeth was on her own. She just taught herself all of these signs. So now I want to tell you, okay, so this is just an example. I had used these sentence builders, but it takes really good fine motor control. So I stopped using that and I just use a red paper strip. All right. How do you test a child who's nonverbal? Lotto games are a dream. Uh, in my book, um, Whole Child Reading, I give seven different steps of difficulty for using lotto games. Don't need speaking ability for any of them, any of the steps. All right, so those are a dream for kids who are nonverbal. Sentence building, like I just showed you, or signing the text. Now, um, for parents, you need to be able to prove to the classroom who assumes that if your child is nonverbal or close to nonverbal, they're going to assume that the intelligence matches that, which is dumb. Not so. I mean, in Elizabeth's case, she was so smart. So, but she, Elizabeth went to a new school and they stuck her in the back of the classroom. She's nonverbal. She's not talking well and she must not be thinking either. Well, so I told her mom what to do. I said, first, Make a video of Elizabeth first. Pick out a story you're going to read from the IC book, which is one of my one of, one of my program books. All right, so pick out the story she's going to read in front of the camera. All right, first make a video of her signing every one of those words that are in the book. Just signing in front of the camera. Okay, Elizabeth, what what is the sign for bird, for example? All right, so you make that video first. Then you make a video of her reading the book, the book's in front of her, and she is signing as she reads along. And then the mom can say the word after she has signed it, just for the teacher's sake. So I said, okay, send videotape, videotape that, which she did. I said, send it into the teacher. She did. And the child's classroom experience completely changed because then the teacher understood that we have to show them. <laughs> we have to show them. All right. On a different topic, what about dyslexia? One in five individuals have a dyslexia. Most are, this is a typical population, just typical population. Most are not diagnosed. They have to be taught with phonics. And one of my certified teachers that I've certified <clears throat> is also a dyslexia specialist. And she said, when she found out about the magic decoding card, she gave a card to every single one of her dyslexia students. And she said, they won't be without them now. It stays in their hand because it helps them a great deal. All right. <clears throat> All right. Are there other visual diagnoses that can interfere with your learner learning to read? Yes. Okay, so here's a picture of Emily. Why is she so close to the book? She's got a vision issue. And sometimes she would turn sideways and try and be that close. And her grandmother and I both kept telling each other, she's got a vision issue. She's got a vision issue. We know she's got a vision issue. So grandma took her in twice to Kaiser Permanente to get evaluated. And they, they said, ah, no, her vision's fine. And grandma and I a year later saying, she's got a vision issue. So grandma put up the money to take her to a private vision specialist. And he said, they should have caught this in 10 minutes. She has blah, 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 blah. She needs these certain kind of glasses. So don't give up if you feel in your gut <laughs> intuitively, there's something else going on here. Well, yeah, there is. All right, let's see, do we have time? Yes. Okay, here is a technique that is so super simple, free, um, and it works matter if it's a Down syndrome speech delay, which in this case it is, TMT syndrome, too much trouble syndrome. All right, or whether it's apraxia, this is a help. So here we go. This is one of my resources. I have a YouTube channel. This is one of about 100 uh, videos on my YouTube channel. So let's watch it now. Let me see if I can get this. In my reading workshop. <clears throat> Whoops, did I stop it? Yeah. In my reading workshops, I always say, the goal of teaching reading is to teach reading for meaning. And I say, if they read for meaning, they read for life. 
Then I ask, is there a secondary reason for teaching reading? And the answer, of course, is yes. We teach reading to teach talking. We teach reading to teach talking. When a child speaks in only two or three word phrases and then begins to speak in five words. All right, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna jump, whoops, I don't know what happened. I want to jump ahead to where I'm actually demonstrating it. And you repeat that video. So let's take a look at this one. Do the same Minecraft for me, because you love Minecraft, okay? Say Minecraft. Mm, I can't. Good, that's a perfect. That's what I wanted to show. Okay, now we're gonna learn how to say it like you said it last week, remember we worked on it. All right, now you watch my mouth, okay? Minecraft. Minecraft. Craft. Craft. And you watch the mirror. Craft. Craft. Ah, look what you mm. did. That's beautiful. Okay, so then you watch me first, and then you watch the mirror, right? Okay, because Devin is crazy about Minecraft. I see. All right. Okay, so again, you watch me, and then you watch yourself. Watch me first. Minecraft. Minecraft. Craft. Very good. Mine. Mine. No, watch. Close your list. Mine. Mine. Oh, that's great. We're just going to do mine. 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 Oh, beautiful. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. Mine. Mine. That's p perfect. All right, now we're going to put Minecraft. Oh, you're doing good. Now, Minecraft is a difficult word to pull off. Think about it. M I N C R A F T. Good grief. But his motivation to say it correctly is very high because he loves Minecraft. So keep in mind that time. Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. Ah! <laughs> time is everything. I'll just finish that. <laughs> um, so the technique is for the child to watch your mouth then put the mirror in front of them, then watch your mouth, put the mirror, he imitates it because Realistically speaking, if we think about it, our kids don't know what their own mouths look like when they're saying these words. They just don't know. So we make it very visible. So we're in their face with our own mouths and then they get to watch their own. It just, well, as you can see here, you know, it just makes a huge difference. All right, let's keep going. All right, these are my resources. All right, I showed you earlier. My website, and in the old days before COVID, I was blogging all the time. So there are lots of articles there. Um, and there's a search feature on the blog page. So you can type in comprehension or whatever you like. Once COVID started, then I started the vlogs. I started putting up videos every week. So that's where the YouTube channel comes in. All right. And they look like this, <clears throat> Well, they used to. All right. Now, my Facebook page, Down Syndrome Reading with Natalie Hale, so you can follow me there. YouTube, how to find me. It's a little tricky. Natalie Hale Down Syndrome. This will pull up this page. Then just click on the profile picture, and you'll get here, and click on the videos. I also have an Instagram account, which I sometimes use, but not all the times. All right. <clears throat> which materials should you use and when? When should you move on? When do you introduce new material? You have in in my program there's an educator guide and in there is a scaffolding plan all right here's your balancing act if you go too slow with materials and you're using the same materials over and over and over we're going to bore them and lose them if you go too fast and too many new bits of material that they have not mastered that vocabulary yet you're going to discourage them and we use we lose them so you have a balancing act and your balance is your intuition. All right. But as far as what do I do on the first day, second day, third day, fourth day? Uh, last week, Sandra sent everyone who attended a PDF of what I call a parent recipe. It walks you through it. Now, if you weren't here last week, you're going to need to email Sandra and ask her for the parent recipe. All right. Also, I sent, she sent out, for those of you who don't have my book, Whole Child Reading, she sent out a PDF on how to create personal pages. All right, 
So you want to mix it up. You want to keep materials fresh. You do not, if you bore them, you're going to lose them. All right. So for example, if this is your reading journey, okay? Spaghetti, maybe that's first. Then maybe you make a personal page. Then you make a lotto game or I have, I sell a lot of games on my site or an I, the IC book, a personal book, analytic phonics if you need it. This came, comes from the first, the first class. Most of the time we don't need to use phonics at all because children will learn without phonics like my generation and the next decade and the next decade did. Phonics was a very bad no-no when I was in kindergarten and first grade. It was out of style, it didn't work, so they stopped using it. So we learned by repetition and sight. Dick and Jane books, see Dick, see, see Dick, run, run Dick, run, run Jane, run, run baby, run, run spot, run. That's how we learned to read phonics, no. Letter sounds, yes, and repetition and sight words. So, okay, a modified book, which I talked about last time and it's in my book. And letter sounds throughout from the beginning if the learner doesn't know them yet. And last time I talked about an app for letter sounds, Starfall ABC, it's a free app. And the, the, the page in there that, in the app that I recommend is the one with the blocks of letters. And every time you tap the letter, it gives you, after the letter comes out and tells you it's A, all you get after that, every time you tap it is A, 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 A. You just get the sounds, which is why it's so valuable. Everything you teach is taught sandwich style, everything. You teach the words first, that are in the material, you teach the material, and then you teach the words again. All right, hook them first and then teach. All right, all right. I'm going to skip over this part if you, this is all in, in the book anyway. All right, certification course, eight week course, two contact hours per week. I only offer it twice a year. The next time is January, limited to four participants. We meet by Zoom, the meeting time is arranged uh, by unanimous vote, and I can email you information if you want. Q and A. Let me end the show so I can get to, and I'll stop sharing, and I can get to the. Okay. All right. Now I'm looking. We don't. So everybody can unmute if you want, or just unmute when you're ready to ask a question. So how do I find out? If my son also has dyslexia, you're going to have to take the child into a dyslexia institute. Um, there are dyslexia organizations and institutes. That's where you need to go. I had a friend who was the director of one, but that was in Northern Michigan, so it's not gonna help you. So all right, my son is at a first grade reading level. He can read with big letters and books. How do we make the jump to regular books? Okay. I recommend you got my book, Whole Child Reading. I walk you through the whole process, the whole process. Um, regular books. Okay, so if he's he's reading with big letters and books, all right, that's here, and regular books are off screen over here. So you are going to gradually, um, let's see, we, we didn't get to talk about this. Uh, you're going to gradually mature his visual pathway because at this point his visual pathway is immature or undeveloped and very gradually by, by reading and by using the big letters and then gradually coming down, we very gradually come down to a normal size, but that takes a while, that takes a while. So personal books is a great way to do that. Personal pages is a great way to do that. In my book, Whole Child Reading, there's a chapter on modifying trade books, regular books, Books like his kids, you know, his friends are reading about the, the latest movie, you know, Star, uh, not, what is it, the, the uh, heroes, you know, the superpowers, the latest books. You can modify those books and let him read them. And, you know, the book looks the same. It's just that the text block is different. All right. All of these details are in, are in the book. Okay. Daughter's reluctant to try the program. Will work me with my granddaughter. Oh, twice a week for 20 minutes help since she will not get repetition. Um, all right. Oh, this is Mark. Okay. All right. And Mark, you can unmute if you want. Uh, you asked this question. Will working with my granddaughter twice a week for 20 minutes help? Yes. Since she will not get repetition. 
Absolutely. Something is better than zero, right? Right. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, it's almost as though I'm working with fear of failure on both my daughter's side and my granddaughter's. So it's kind of like overcoming both those issues now. Right. Okay. So now, Mark, you you got the program, right? You have the whole program? Yes. yes. All, right. all right. So step one is to put all those food books out in front of her and let her choose. Have you done that yet? I, I've even I've made three, three different per, um, personal books for her as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> is she engaged so. by them? Um, she is partially, but the last time I was with her, I, I asked her more information. She said she likes singing, so I did the last one. I got to take her today. It was about singing. <laughs> and okay. I like singing. I sing loud. Um, just basic stuff like that. All right, Mark, stick with that book for until in, unless she starts getting bored. Stick okay. with that book and get her so to where she's actually reading most of it, and right. then show that to your daughter. Okay. Yeah. You're gonna prove it all, oh, although. Okay, our kids are, do not like to perform on demand. So right. what you might want to do is, if she's reading at your house with just yeah. you, and she's comfortable and she's doing really well, you get your phone out and video that and send okay. it to your daughter. Oh, yeah, because I have to go to their house when my daughter's taking the other two kids to swim lessons, and then I got about half an hour to, to teach okay. her. Okay, okay. Uh, All right. Yeah, but, but it's yes, just Karen right. Drehoff. That's good. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then I'm going to continue that that route. Oh. I was just afraid that what I teach her is going to be going to waste. And then it's like, now I got another 10 minutes or 10, 20 minutes later. It's like, but yeah. I, I do see, I do see that with it. It's like, because with, last time I talked to her, she said that, well, what if it doesn't work? It's like, you got to try it. It's like, like, and I try not to be critical because I'm not there all the time. So I, I but I told her this book is like, if, like they were in your house talking about you. I said, that you got to read the book and getting her to do that is also it's difficult. Yeah. difficult. Right, right, right. So, but, um, so I'm, I think, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So if you can prove at all that she's uh -huh. on at all with your super limited time, which which is, you know, against the rules. So if 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 uh -huh. you can actually succeed at all with that and tell your daughter, look, and I'm just giving a tiny amount of the time, mm -hmm. imagine what she could do if mm -hmm. she had full time. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Sounds okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Great. Let's see. Now we're there. Okay. Okay. Anybody else who wants to ask a question, just unmute, unmute, come off mute and ask away. One more question. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. um, in your book, you mentioned the fluctuating hearing. How does that display itself? Because I mean, I've oh. noticed that that at some certain times she'll sit across the room and then she'll make this loud noise. She never does. It. Is that because all of a sudden her hearing goes? No, uh, by that I meant like tubes in the ears, sometimes, some uh, years and sometimes some years not. Is she sound sensitive? Some kids are terribly she, sound. When she was younger, she seemed to be. Okay. But, um, over time, she sings really loudly. I, I call her because she's want, like, wanting attention and that's why I think that she does that personally. Well, uh, your intuition's <laughs> probably right. <laughs> yeah, because I know the rest of the family just tells us, stop talking loud, and I'll I'll jump in with her and make those noises like, oh, we want attention. <laughs> so, and then she kind of calms down after that. But Right, right. Could be hearing loss. Could be a slight hearing yeah. loss. My, okay. son, my son, who's 38, speaks way too loud. It's like, uh -huh. Don, softer, softer. <laughs> yeah. But he also listens to music really loud, so. Yeah. You know, who knows? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Lorraine, did you have a question? I, I don't know. I guess just a, maybe a clarification. Um, so I don't know. So my son is actually 14 and he's been working with Every Child a Reader um, at Club 21 for years. And he has, we've used a lot of these you know, it's all very visual. We have all the books, the personal books, the da da da. He can read a lot of it. And that's why I was asking about like, it just, there's never been a consistency of, you know, from what he's learning there to then what he was doing at school. Of course, that's a whole disaster. And then, um, you know, he's at a point now where he's 14 and he's just, um, it, I think he's given up like he's he just doesn't care um, to try and read anymore. He loves books. 
comic books and books, but he doesn't have any interest in trying to read it himself anymore. Oh. Also, my daughter has dyslexia. My, my husband has dyslexia. So that's why I was asking of like, there's that part of me that's like, does he also have dyslexia? My mother-in-law has it, you know, so it runs in the family. Um, right, right. And, it, and he's so bright and he gets so much and understands and visually he's there. We've worked with phonics. But the consistency isn't there. I see. I know that, um, you know, and yeah. and so making that um, transition or that jump to like. I OK, let me ask you this. I'm just lost <laughs> at this right, point. Right. I feel like I've tried everything. Right. So uh, clarify for me the materials that he's reading in the the uh, Every child a reader is that the name of the the program? Ecar, they call it Ecar. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, All right. So, what is the level that he's been reading? What is the size of the type? Does it match what the school is now showing? No, I mean, look, he's in full inclusion, so it's a hard one. He has to get his his you know his material modified by an inclusion facilitator, which yeah. depending on who the facilitator is, it may get modified or may not. Um, right. So right now I have, I actually have no idea. You know, he's in eighth okay. grade. They don't teach reading anymore. No, 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 no. So obviously modification is you know essential, but what I'm thinking of is him reading for his own enjoyment and wanting to read. Um, what was the, the level that he was reading? What did, what did the materials look like? Was it still big print? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It needs it's to still it's still big print like what we read at home he does not read for his own enjoyment at school um he no but can he read at home for his own enjoyment yes but he doesn't he does not choose to he looks at all the books yeah so there's will not like right. sit there and actually right I don't know, maybe i'm wrong maybe he's reading but i don't think so you could easily find out by by creating a few personal pages at the level you think he is in small type you know in in regular not not 12 yeah, yeah just sort of smaller yeah exactly exactly yeah. okay and do it on computer don't try to print it because we really want to find out if he's reading or not so do it on computer so on a printer so it's got you know the font is great um and use a sans serif font meaning a font without the little curl cues on the end yes i, yeah. I, talked, I talked about that the other week okay. um, find out find out the personal pages are the ideal way to find out what he's actually reading what he's actually struggling with how far he's actually come okay. and i would not use a smaller font than 32 38 point okay find out okay yeah, email, email me let me know what you find out because what the what a good reading program is supposed to do is gradually bring the reader down yeah and also you know so find out create a personal page or two and then based on what you know what you, based on what you find out then maybe have him evaluated by a dyslexia organization yeah okay that's why i never knew like to actually reach out to a dyslexia Mm -hmm. No, they're, they're, they're they're like, oh, he has Down syndrome. How are they going to figure it out? They're just going to say it's Down syndrome, you know. Diagnostic overshadowing. Now you know that. Okay. Yeah, that was great. Dyslexia. Yeah, he can also have dyslexia. Yes. Thank you. All right. Anybody else want to say anything? All right. So everybody can unmute and we'll say goodbye. Thank you so much. This was super helpful. I wish I had been there the first week, but uh, I will definitely now, now I know where to find all your info. Good. Yeah. And they recorded it so you can get the recording from. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. It was, Thank it was you. real informative. I'm now I'm trying to get my daughter to, to get this class too as well. Or all take right. this class. First. All right. All right. If you can get her to read the book, the book is so encouraging, right? Like yeah, said, I actually got two of those books. I told her, I said, here's one for you. I said, and maybe the, uh, the teacher at school will help one to read yes. the other one. I said, like, donate that to her. We'll yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually had a teacher email me and say, I read this book in one day. I didn't yeah. stop. I just kept going. Yeah. Yeah, every chapter was almost as though I was reading about my family. So I thought, wow, oh, this is perfect. It's, it's wow. 
just getting her to open it is like, please read it. Yeah, right, it right. Was, I mean, everything was, but she's at that point where she's like, well, it's all dancing, but it's not that way. It's like there's different reasons for it. You got to look at this. It's like talking about you. Absolutely, absolutely. But I don't want to be critical about her either, too, because I'm not there at 24 hours, so she's dealing with issues right. that I don't see. So right, 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 right. Well, keep me posted, Mark. Really, I will. Thank you. Goes. Thank you so much. Okay, you're very welcome.